What strategies do you use to avoid making impulsive decisions during trading? So I feel like so many traders fall in the trap of making impulsive trading decisions because they don't think about trading as a career. So for me, one thing that made me stand out, especially with not making such uninformed decisions, especially like uh, taking impulsive traders, I treat my trading like a nine to five job. So I have specific times where I dedicate to sit by the screens, you know, and I normally like to trade between London session and the New York session. You know, so as far as I am seated by the screen, I'm monitoring everything that I'm doing to take a position. I don't consider that impulsive because at that point I'm going through my normal thought process of determining my metrics for taking a position. But it will be impulsive if I know that let's say I'm supposed to be trading between the hours of 4 a.m. to let's say 12 p.m. And then suddenly I come back by my screen and then um, let's say 3 p.m. I suddenly see something new. I'm like, wow, this looks like something juicy. Let me just take it. Then I'm acting impulsive. So I try to stick to a specific schedule just like any other employee would be asked to, you know, work from, let's say, 8 to 5. If you choose to work from, let's say, 6, 7 or 8, then it's really up to you if there should be any, uh, let's say, a sudden uh, um, unforeseen circumstance or uh, an accident in the workspace, then you put your own self to jeopardy because you chose to work overtime. You know, in that logic, in trading too, then you're supposed to like trade from, let's say, 4 to 12. And then within that space, you are consciously aware of what you're watching. So if you go back and then you're not, you're casually out there and then you come back to see a position at, let's say, 3 or 4 and you suddenly take it, then you could just be putting yourself in that jeopardy that an employee who's supposed to work within a set of a time frame is, is choosing to, to do. So that's what allows me not to continuously like fall in the trap of um, taking impulsive trades though. Well, in hindsight, what you're basically saying is you're treating your trading as a business. Yes, basically. <laughs> That's nice. How do you guys do it, though? For, for me? Uh, no, to not fall in impulsive, sudden. For me, is simple. To avoid uh, getting into impulsive trades is following a trading plan. Because if you don't uh, plan... Uh, you're you're bound to fail, you know. Um, the way they normally say, if you fail, the, if you fail to plan, you <laughs> plan to fail. So would you say like trading plan is like the broader aspect of preventing that errors in trading? Yeah, it's like my ten commandment yeah. tablet. So I have to follow each rule, and that's like a compa uh, compass. It guides me into getting into trade. So I'm doing my analysis. I'm choosing what assets to trade uh, before the market opens. In your case, you said London yeah. session, where you have a lot of movement. So I have to choose before it o the market opens. And uh, I, once I choose three or five, that's all I'm focusing mm. on. If they meet my threshold and I follow strictly my trading plan, then I get in and I take the shot. Mm. Which assets uh, you mostly use for London sessions? Which? Which assets? Oh, so I normally would trade a pound pairs, the pound crosses. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for London session, f f if I'm day, if I'm tr if I'm day trading, I would specifically stick to uh, predominantly watching the pound pairs. But within that same hours, I'm still like looking at my swing trading setups, which would normally would take like a day or two to materialize. But for day trading purposes, I stick to pound USD, pound card, pound JPY, and then Euro GBP, just because they move very fast and I can easily make like 50, 70 pips before the day or the, the morning ends. Yeah. I think if um, uh, you use the London session, uh, you, you uh, don't use it with USD. Uh, go for JPY, GPP, JPY, and other uh, crosses. Because uh, USD session is closed that time, so you can uh, take a good trades from uh, other crosses. Yeah, so what makes it interesting is that uh, because um, logically it's like two economies, which is the UK economy and then the um, US economy in this, in this sense, even if the US is sleeping and then there's a vibrant thing going on in the UK, it tends to make pound USD move extremely wild than even the other currency pairs. It normally would happen with the um, antipodian pairs. Like mm. you'd normally observe that when you're watching, let's say Euro AUD, 
right? And then or AUD USD and AUD card, they like to move in the Asian sessions because the Europe market is silent and dead. So they are active. So it tends to see if there's a negative um, fundamental or any that comes from their side, then you see their currency extremely selling off. And if it's a positive one, you see them extremely like rallying. So sometimes you would miss your setup that you were looking at to take for let's say euro aud because you slept and woke up very early in the morning especially if you mm -hmm. if you live in a country that aligns with like london session and it happens to me a lot so i tend to observe that it's only because um those european market are silent the other cross pair are active so any trigger then it allows them the market tends to not have like a certain direction especially when two markets are open that's my observation though because like things are happening in the u.s it's triggering the u.s side of gbp usd and things are happening in the uk is also triggering the pound side of gbp usd so you tend to see let's say london session rally up and then in the afternoon new york session rally down mm -hmm. so you want to find that sweet spot where one is sleeping one is active and you can get one direction for a long time mm -hmm. yeah. do you remember your most successful trade which instrument was it of course i do remember my most successful trade was trading nvidia stock on an er earnings call very exciting moment i love earnings call especially for tech stocks and i did a purchase i, I did buy uh, and it was very successful. It was like, I think, 20%. So I made a lot of money and I was very happy, of course. Is it something you expected? It's expected since I have been studying NVIDIA for a long time, all the cheap strategies. Uh, I follow Bitcoin technology, so I know what mining was doing for, for this kind of stuff. So I did study a lot. It was not a gamble, definitely. It's not that risky. I, I mean, the, the account was very uh, big and it was not that big. I mean, the, I mean the percentage of risk. The, you mean where did I position my, my stop loss? Yeah. Uh, it was a position like very below because I just wanted to trade the earnings call. So it, I, so, wanted, so I, I wanted to be close at, uh, op at the open of the market. So I think he's driving towards you risk like 5% of your account or 10%. Ah, you can't control it on an earnings call. Okay. Because mm. if the gap is too big, you can't control it, even though you position at a stop loss. Yeah, yeah. So it's more risky. How has your approach to learning and improving as a trader evolved over the years? My approach initially started with just looking at technical indicators. And um, at the very beginning, that's what really attracted me to it because you backtest, you see all these perfect entry levels, you see all the tech profit levels. And then later on, I discovered a lot of the indicators were lagging indicators that so they were not really suited for my kind of strategy. Um, so I then later decided to mix the technical analysis and looking at fundamental analysis because my background is news. So fundamental analysis is really like my my cup of coffee. So I incorporated fundamental analysis and, of course, looking at sentiment, the court report, for example. Combining those three is like the proverbial story of the three-legged stools. So the three have to balance uh, in order for me to get into the trade. And I always say, a trade, my trade has to tell a story. So if I am buying a currency pair, I have to tell a story about why I'm buying it. And so my evolving is acquiring more knowledge, keeping um, keep learning about the markets and uh, borrowing from the different strategies from uh, people around me, people I look up to, and I'll just borrow something small from here, something small from another place, combining all that, that feeds to my, you know, trading profile. Uh -huh. So which is your uh, best indicator to take a new trade? I, your most uh, favorite indicator for trade? <laughs> Well, there are a couple of them. I will say at the moment I look at, you know, volume. I'm really, really keen on volume because uh, once you have volume, uh, then it can give me an idea of momentum because mm -hmm. there are times when you're trading something that has no volume, so you don't have a lot of buyers or sellers or mm -hmm. participants in that particular asset class. Mm -hmm. And so getting in there will eventually just lead me into just bouncing up and down. You're not really having a trend. And so I pretty much look at volume. 
mm. um, as one of my favorite indicators. Yes, volume is a most important uh, indicator for trading. Yeah. Oh, so you agree with me? Yes, I also. <laughs> What do you guys think? Yeah, yeah, yeah I love volume. <laughs> it's like our oxygen trade. <laughs> oh, I like that. And for the process, I think the, uh, it's the ABL strategy I have just made up. It's the always be learning strategy. <laughs> Can I borrow that? Of course. <laughs> ABL. All right, mm. great. How has your trading strategy evolved over the years? And what lessons did you learn from these changes? I think um, it changes by applying, um, testing many things. Like I am testing some indicators. I find working of them and some others not working. And when I find the working one, I keep testing them. Uh, over many, many many charts, like many currencies, many indices, and when I find a one working well, I keep testing it on many time frames. So maybe one of them working on a daily time frame, and other one not working on uh, on daily. So I keep testing them until I find the best one working on most of long uh, frames. That is that was uh, the best thing that have changed my strategy over the years and. Um, Of course, uh, the main thing for me was adding and uh, my favorite indicator, ATR, the average true range. Oof, I love it. Yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> it was my uh, my best risk management strategy ever, and uh, it keeps it keeps me growing my account gradually without risking many of uh, my account. That's it. Oh, you talked about you know back testing. Do you have a your own rule of thumb when you're back testing using an indicator like how long do you go back or try out one month two months uh, no no normally i uh, test for like three years oh three, three years. years yeah yeah i have to i have to see what happened before so one month or two months maybe there is a news or something happened in yeah. previous two months so it's not enough for me i need to see a long period so Usually I do three years back testing. So what determines if an indicator is not good for you or is good? Um, first thing is lagging uh, because I saw many indicators lagging and repainted indicators. So Like 90% of indicators in the market repaint mm. and lag. Lagging indicators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I use some tools that, uh, that can replay the charts. So when I when I pre- replay the chart, I can see what what indicators gives me as the actual moment. So I keep seeing this for the previous three years, and I can see if it's working or not. Uh, what's one habit which uh, sets you for a success trading day that you wouldn't change? Proper money management is most important, other than any indicators and uh, any strategies to use. Uh, one thing, if uh, I use the proper money management so I can win all the tradings and uh, uh, all the uh, trade strategies. Uh, I do trades flipping the coins, nice. uh, 10 trades and uh, use only price action, uh, use only the money management, uh, one ratio three. So seven trades are negative. Uh, seven, six trades are negative but my whole uh, trades are in profit so money management and uh, risk reward ratio is the most important for trading totally agree mm. yeah. so what if the um, last three trades went into profit but let's say one is to one no if uh, you use the money management or uh, risk reward you can go for the one ratio three uh, or four or five um, if uh, you no, prefer I, the one ratio one i mean um like with that coin tossing like you mm. said i'm just giving an example that what if the seven straight stop loss mm. but the last three that went well they did not reach the um targeted profits let's say one is to three but rather reach one is to one and then reverse back to a loss would you still uh, no uh, then prefer for one ratio three or one ratio four uh, because uh, if you one ratio one then uh, that was not uh, it's working <laughs> <laughs> I, I, get, i get you I, i'm getting a question <laughs> and you know for me his style is yeah. um I think it fits your profile. I, I've done that several times. I find it a bit tricky because if you do the fast, the, if you lose, like you said, the fast seven, and then you win the last three, 
but your risk to reward ratio is still one to one and then the last three goes then it down. reverses <laughs> then, you then you're still in a loss <laughs> and uh, what i personally do is incorporate what he's saying the risk reward ratio plus position sizing risk management for me is is one of the biggest lessons in trading so position sizing to avoid over leveraging and so i look at the size <coughs> of the account and decide what percentage am i risking in that account and then now i can go to the next step which is risk to reward ratio so if it is 1 to 3 1 to 5 more often than not is more than actually 1 to 5 because i'm a swing trader so i'm going for the big swing so mm. sometimes it can be 1 to even 10 so the reward is much more in that sense but 1 to 10 ratio sometimes it can go mm -hmm. on to 10 but mm -hmm. that is holding a trade for even more than a month at times mm -hmm. so you are saying that you can determine that um let's say for a position i want to take 5% um risk but your trading setup you're looking at 1 is to 5 means that 5% for 25% exactly <laughs> <laughs>